your mercy and your love, Lord God, that you show us all the time, Lord God. And Father, we do, uh, we do pray, Lord God, that uh, any others coming, Lord, for this service of the, uh, the preaching hour, Lord, that uh, that uh, you'll, you'll be with them, Lord, that uh, you give them travel and mercies, Lord, you'll get them here safe and whole, Lord God. And Father, we do pray for the, our sick ones. We've got Sister Linda out. And Father, we have others with, uh, with afflictions and illnesses, Lord. And uh, we've got uh, Brother Steve's coming. We're going to have a surgery this this coming up week, Lord God. And Lord, we pray, Lord God, that uh, you put your healing hand on us, Lord God, each and every one, Lord, and, and uh, all the family members, Lord. And Father, to help us, Lord, and strengthen us, Lord. Help us, heal us, Lord, and uh, keep us uh, in the right mind, right attitude, Lord, Father, and, and our families too, Lord God. And we're looking to hear from you from the Sunday school class and the preaching hour, Lord God, that uh, you'll be in it, that you have the, the message you have us to have today, Lord, that uh, the pastor's anointed with the with the 11 o'clock uh, message, Lord God, and and uh, Brother Dale with the, uh, with the trail of blood, Lord, and Father, that, uh, that uh, our hearts are prepared and ready, and, and uh, Father, that uh, we're willing and ready to receive thy word, Lord, and Father, just uh, just help us and strengthen us, Lord, in these vile, wicked days that we're in, and we'll thank you and praise you, Lord, Jesus Christ's name we do pray, amen. 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 You know, we have to uh, baptize Brother Tim since he said he got saved. But I ain't going in that river <laughs> this time. It was so cold. I went in March one time when I baptized my daughter. and She cried, and I wanted to join her. <laughs> but it was so cold, my legs burned. But I... Really, what I'm really waiting for is not the weather to warm up. I'm waiting for the water level to go down since we've had all this rain. Because I know once he steps into the river, I'm going to overflood the banks. <laughs> I was showing him the creek on the way. We came around on 301. We were just baptizing the creek. Down oh, yeah. But uh, anyway, Brother Tim, come lead us in a song. And then uh, we'll be ready for the Brother Dale Simpson show. Amen. Well, good morning, Concord Baptist Church. Yeah. Can you please stand and turn to page 483. Oh, how I love Jesus. You passed out all the tracks? Yeah? Show your cap Good job. Got a couple of other seats. <clears throat> 483. I'm still wondering. You know why? You know how I can tell that you don't comb your hair in the morning when you come to work? How's that? It doesn't look like that. <laughs> I do, but this is hair gel. Oh. Yeah, I thought it'd get fancy. <laughs> All right, ready, Jess?
today? Oh. Not this morning. Not this morning, huh? Nah, I think Grace broke her guitar and the girls don't have nothing. Uh-oh. <laughs> no guitar. Yeah. can sing. Good morning and welcome to Concord Independent Baptist Church.com for those of you on the web. And on Facebook, it's Frank Townsend, T O W N S E N D. And uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here that made it so far this morning. I understand we have some more coming, and uh, that's a good thing. And glad everybody can make it safely. And our guest, good morning. And uh, we'll continue on this morning in the Trail of Blood, the J.M. Carroll novel that. Uh, kind of gives a testament to we Baptist down through the ages and the persecution of our uh, forebearers there through all sorts of Catholicism and uh, Judaism and everything else, uh, heathenism, and <laughs> just uh, want to, we're getting close to the end here, so we want to uh, uh, we're going to still deviate a little bit from a couple of the names that we get in here. We're on page 46, and first we're going to open up with a quick word of prayer here. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for a beautiful Sunday morning here, Lord, in the Midlands of South Carolina. It is absolutely a beautiful day, and Lord, we... Uh, we give thanks this morning for everything that we have on loan from you and everything that we take for granted. And Lord, we give thanks for everybody that could make it here this morning and those on the way, we ask that you get them here safely. Lord, we, uh, we also at this time ask that you look down on my prayer list and everybody's prayer list here and show some mercy and compassion if it be your will. And Lord, I also ask that you give me the verbal clarity to convey a message this morning, which will be both understanding and insightful. Lord, uh, most importantly, we give thanks this morning for sending your precious son to be my Lord and Savior and all of our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to start here. Uh, we're on the trail of blood in America. These refugeeing Congregationalists and Presbyterians to establish different colonies and immediately within their respective ter territories establish by law their own particular religious views. In other words, Congregationalism and Presbyterianism were made the legal religious views of their colonies. So when, once again we see that the colonists had basically reverted back to some of the things that they had been uh, subjected to in their prior world back in the uh, back on the continent of uh, Europe. This is uh, this to the absolute uh, conclusion of all their religious views. Themselves fleeing the mother country with the bloody marks of persecution still upon them and seeking a home of freedom and liberty for themselves immediately upon it being established in their own colonies in the new land and having the authority, they deny religious liberty to others. Does that sound familiar? And practice upon them the same cruel methods of persecution, especially did they so treat the Baptist or we Baptist, as I would like to say. Uh, the southern colonies in Virginia, North and South Carolina were settled mainly by the adherents of the Church of England. Uh, the peculiar views of the church were made, uh, the church were made the established religion in these colonies. Thus the view of the land of, of America where many other Congregationalists, Pres Presbyterians and Episcopalians have come seeking the privilege of worshiping God according to the dictates of their own consciences, uh, there were soon set up three established churches, no religious liberty for any except those who held governmental authority. The children of Rome are following the bloody footsteps of their mother. Their own reformation is yet 
far from complete. And once again here, it just goes to show how even in the land of freedom, the, uh, the ability to worship as you wish was, uh, was negated once they got here. Uh, with the immigrants to America came many scattering Baptists, by some still called Anabaptists. There were probably some in every American-bound vessel. They came, however, in comparatively small groups, never in large colonies. They would not have been permitted to come in, to, in that way, but they kept coming. Before the colonies are thoroughly established, the Baptists are numerous and almost everywhere. But they soon began to feel the heavy hand of, of the three state churches for the terrific offense of preaching the gospel and refusing to have their children baptized, opposing infant baptism, and other like <coughs> conscientious acts on their part. They were arrested, imprisoned, fined, whipped, woo banished, and their property confiscated, etc. All that there in America, from many sources I give, but a few illustrations. So the hardships followed them to the new world. And if you were not part of the established church, you were certainly going to be subjected to whatever, I guess you would say, uh, banishment or any kind of uh, persecution that they could come up with. Uh, they even uh, still burnt people at the stake at this time. And before the Massachusetts Bay Colony is 20 years old, when the congregational, with the congregational as the state church, they pass laws against the Baptist and others. Uh, the following is a sample of the law. It is ordered and agreed that if any person or persons <laughs> within the jurisdiction shall either in openly condemn or oppose the Baptist baptizing of infants or go about secretly to seduce others from their approbation. approbation <laughs> and use thereof and shall principally personally depart the congregation and the administration of the ordinance after due time and means of conviction every such person or persons shall be sentenced to banishment this this law was enacted especially against the baptist so you can see we once again here landed in the new world and Everything's the same. Uh, by the authorities in this colony, Roger Williams and others were banished. Banishment in America in those days was something desperately serious. It was meant to go and live among the Native Americans, which uh, we call Indians. In this case, Williams was received kindly for quite a while, lived among the Indians. He also learned their language and was uh, very well thought of by most of the, the natives here. Uh, and, and in days proved a great blessing to the colony, which had banished him. He saved the colony from destruction by the same tribe of Indians. By, by his earnest entreaties in their behalf. In this way, he returned good for evil. And the name of these, these Native Americans was the Nar Raganaset? Ragan you say so. Yeah, it was uh, the. Narragansett. Narragansett. James was. Yep, there. close. Yeah. The Narragansett, as Brother James here says. Uh, he, like I said, he learned their language and was able to communicate with them. Uh, Roger Williams, uh, he is also credited with being the founder of Rhode Island. He uh, was a staunch believer in separation of church and state. 
uh, born in London in 1603 and died in Rhode Island in 1683 uh, and was instrumental in moving to Rhode Island and etching out a piece of property and I guess he got the title with uh, from the Indians and uh, I think it's uh, goes to say we don't know what he bartered with them for. I know there's tales of blankets and beads and that kind of stuff, but uh, that later kind of fell apart. Uh, and once again, here he had to side with the with the with the uh, colonists versus the Indians. Uh, this later led to another sad tale in American history called King Philip's War. And uh, the dates was around 1660 to 1670. It actually didn't go on but a couple of years, but there was some bitter fighting between the local tribes there in New England and the colonists. Uh, I don't know how they worked out the deals uh, for the real estate, but it is a sad tale because along with the Europeans came measles, mumps, chicken pox, and a whole host of uh, viruses that the poor Indians were not, uh, did not have any natural immunity for, and uh, it wreaked havoc on them. At this point, before this, and I may have mentioned this before, but here locally in South Carolina, between, I guess, the North Edisto River and the Water Ree River was a group of Indians known as the Cofitachiqui. And the Cofitachiqui Indians were known as the people of the pearls. And Hernando de Soto knew this. And he and his band of conquistadors in 1540 made a move up through Georgia and into South Carolina crossing the Savannah River. He lost a bunch of hogs, which now still proliferate the swamp down there, Dave. So <laughs> you might be eating some of the uh, descendants from the Spanish. <laughs> and uh, they moved up into central South Carolina to the land of the Cofitachiqui, which they had a chieftainess that was in charge, and it was a, a female, and she was a little bit enamored by the Spanish. Of course, they were six or seven hundred strong. Uh, when the hogs were crossing the Savannah River and some of them got away, they, now all of a sudden, uh, that was their lunch, so they, they got a little hungry along the way and were desperate for food by the time they had crossed into uh, crossed the North Edisto up into lower uh, Lexington County and Orange, what is now Orangeburg County. But they were looking for these Indians that were known as the people of the pearls. And when they got here, they found that most of the pearls had had a hole burned into them. They would take a, a piece of straw and keep going back and forth in one spot so they could put a string through it and hang it around their neck. And when you passed away, you were usually buried with your personal belongings and these pearls would be buried with you. Now there's all sorts of Indian mounds now down around Utahville. There's some on the other side of the water reef. And I know where there's one up here off of Old Rapids Road close to Lake Murray Dam where we know Indians were, uh, I guess it was a hold up camp or whatever, had a settlement there that would have been all prior to the white man being here. And DeSoto managed to coerce the chieftainess to let him dig into these piles and extract these pearls. Well, these pearls had been buried with human remains and very moist soil and by the time he was digging them up they were not worth anything and he wasn't exactly what he was looking for but that also incensed a bunch of the indians and uh respectfully so they kind of 
told him he needed to hit the bricks. And he, uh, he headed out in toward North Carolina and eventually wound up down in Louisiana and Mississippi, the lower part there, where some of the dogs got loose from him. And the descendants of, or did, are you from down in that area? Louisiana? Yeah. Are you familiar with a Catahoula hog dog? I think that's our state dog. That's one of them. Yeah, well, I, I know them as Catahoula hog dogs, and they're uh, a lot of the, the purebred, I guess you could call them purebred, they're baying hounds. They're not like attack dogs, like a, like a terrier. And uh, some of the geneticists down in that area, down in Louisiana and Mississippi, claim that some of the dogs that they have, the, the high dollar ones, are descended from the Spanish conquistador, De Soto, who moved in there in the 1540s. Uh, once again here, there was, in this area, out of Port Royal, South Carolina, there was another Spanish uh, settlement down there, and a couple of them had made forays into the Midlands here, and once again had brought disease and pestilence with them, and they were starting to I guess it would spread amongst the Indians by the time Soto got here, DeSoto, and he brought the rest of it. And uh, by the time around 1716, 1717, here in the Midlands, the what was the descendants of the Kofit Chiqui were rounded up and herded into the Catawba Nation, which is up there below Charlotte. And it is a sad tale of how they had dwindled from eight or 9,000 when DeSoto came through here down to like 20 to 25 Whoa. Indians or Native Americans. They had been virtually wiped out. And uh, I'm sure there was some fighting amongst them but and fighting with the settlers too, but it was not, uh, the, the big killer was, was disease and pestilence. Uh, there is some of this with King Philip's War, as once again, the natives had no resistance to what we considered as herd immunity that came with the Europeans, uh, and they were devastated. Uh, Williams, once again, befriended the Indians and actually lived with them for a while, uh, went back to England with John Clark, which is in the next paragraph here, and they both tried to coerce the king to uh, give them a title to some real estate that uh, they could practice their Baptist religion in, or what would become Baptist. Uh, we'll go here, uh, number eight there. Roger Williams later together with some others, some of whom at least had also been banished from that and other other of the colonies, among whom was John Clark, a Baptist preacher, decided, decided to organize a colony on their own. As yet, they had no legal authority from England uh, to do such a thing, but they thought this step wiser under existing conditions than to attempt to live in existing colonies with the awful religious restrictions then upon them. So finding a small section of land as yet unclaimed by the existing colony, they proceeded to establish themselves on that section of land known, known, now known as Rhode Island. That was in the year of 1638. Ten years later than the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but when it was about 25 years later, 1663, before they were able to secure a legal charter. And like I say, uh, Williams and Clark both went back to England and Williams came back about a year later and left Clark there to, I guess you would say, petition the king who was Charles II to try to get a charter for what is now known as Rhode Island. There's a little bit of problem with this is somebody owned that property and it was the Native Americans. I don't like to go down this road too much, but it is it should be known that 
it wasn't just a blank parcel of land that was just sitting out there. There was somebody that liked to hunt and fish on it. And uh, for a while there, they worked out their differences. But later, it all came to fisticuffs when when uh, King Philip's War started. Uh, in the year 1651, Roger Williams and John Clark were sent by the colony to England to secure a possible legal permission to establish their colony. When they reached England, Oliver Cromwell was in charge of the government, but for some reason he failed to grant their request. Roger Williams returned home to America. John Clark remained in England to continue to press his plea. Year after year went by, Clark continued to remain. Finally, Cromwell lost his position and Charles II sat upon the throne of England. When, while Charles is regarded in the history as one of the bitterest persecutors of Christians, he finally, in 1663, granted that charter. Clark, after 12 long years of waiting, returned home with that charter. So in 1663, the Rhode Island colony became a, re a real legal institution and the Baptists could write their own constitution. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that is the way we did it back then and we are what we are and that we are here today, so we move forward. That constitution was written it attracted the attention of the whole wide world and that constitution was the world's first declaration of religious liberty the battle for absolute religious liber liberty even in america alone is a great history within itself for a long time the baptists seemed to have fought that battle entirely alone but they did not fight it for themselves alone but for all people of every every religious faith rhode island the first Baptist colony established by a small group of Baptists after 12 years of earnest pleading for, permi for permission was the first spot on earth where religious liberty was made the law of the land. The settlement was made in 1638, the colony legally established in 1663. In this colony, two Baptist churches were organized even prior to the illegal establishment of the colony. As to the exact date of the organization of at least one of these two churches, even the Baptists, according to the history, are at disagreement. I can't imagine Baptists being <laughs> disagreeing with one another. Gee, what do you think we are? Heathens? All seem to be agreed as to the date of the organization of one at Providence by Roger Williams in 1639. As the date of one of the or as to the date of the one organized at Newport by John Clark, all of the le later testimony seems to give the date as 1638. All the earlier seems to be to give it later, uh, some years later. The one organized by Roger Williams at Providence seems to have lived but a few months. The other by John Clark at Newport is still living. My own opinion as to the date of the organization of Newport Church based on all available data is, a, is that 1638 is the correct date. Personally, I'm not sure the date is correct. I am it, sure. I am sure the date is correct. Excuse me. Yeah. And um, once again here, um, here in America, I guess if we think about it, that Rhode Island would be part of our heritage, whether we descended exactly from them or not. As to uh, the persecutions in some of the American colonies, we give a few, ex a few samples. It is recorded that on one occasion, one of John Clark's members was sick. The family lived just across the Massachusetts Bay Colony line and just inside the colony. John Clark himself and a visiting preacher by the name of Crandall and a layman by the name of Obathiah Holmes, all three went to visit the sick family. While they were holding some kind of prayer service with the sick family, 
some officer or officers of the colony came upon them and arrested them and later carried them before the court for trial. It is also stated that in order to get a more definite charge against them, they were carried into a religious meeting of their church, the Congregationalists, their hands being tied, so the record states, the charges against them was for not taking off their hats in a religious service. They were all tried and convicted. Now, I sometimes wear a hat in here till I remember I got it on my head and then I take it off or I put my glasses on my head and Tommy gives me the high sign that I've Got my glasses on my head. It's not a fashion statement, folks. It is an error. Uh, Governor Endicott was present. In a rage, he said to Clark while the trial was going on, You have denied infant's baptism. This was not the charge against him. You deserve a death. I will not have such trash brought into my jurisdiction. The penalty for all was a fine or, or be whipped. Woo! <laughs> Crandall's fine. <laughs> a visitor was five pounds or $25. Clark's fine. The pastor was 20 pounds, about a hundred bucks. And uh, Holmes fine, the records say, had been a Congregationalist and had joined the Baptist was 30 pounds or 150 bucks. Clark and Crandall's fines were paid by friends. Holmes refused to allow his fine to be paid, saying he had done no wrong, so was whipped. Woo <laughs> the record states that he was stripped to the waist and then whipped Yee! with some kind of special whip. Couldn't use an ordinary whip, just had to get a special whip. Uh, until the blood ran down his body and then his legs until his shoes overflowed. Brothers, that had to have been a painful experience. When you're bleeding and you feel your boots up? Ooh. The record goes on to state that his body was so badly gashed and cut that for two weeks he could not lie down so his body could touch the bed. His sleeping had to be done on his hands or elbows and knees. That's a hard way to sleep. Uh, of this whipping, sounds like our uh, guardsmen that were relegated to the parking garage last week in Washington. Of this whipping and other things connected with it, I read all records, even Holmes' statement, a thing could hardly have been more brutal and there and here in America. And, uh, you know, that just goes to show everybody be thankful of the religious liberty that we enjoy today because this can change. And I, I implore each and every one of you to thank God every day in your prayers for this liberty. I feel like we take it for granted way too much. Uh, Painter, another man, refused to have his child baptized and gave his opinion that infant bapti baptism was an anti-Christian ordinance. For these offenses, he was tied tried and uh, tied and whipped. You! Uh, Governor Winthrop tells us that Painter was whipped for reproaching the Lord's ordinances. Hmm. That's questionable. Um, we'll not go into all of that. Uh, in the colony were uh, where Presbyterians, Presbyterianism was established, the established religion, dissenters, Baptists and others, seemed to fare no better than in the Massachusetts Bay Colony where Congregationalism was the established religion. And this colony was a settlement of Baptists. In the whole settlement, there were, there were only five other families. The Baptists recognized the laws 
they were under and were, according to the records, obedient to them, this incident occurred. It was decided by authorities of the colony to build a Presbyterian meeting house in that Baptist settlement. The only way to do it seemed by taxation. The Baptists recognized the authority of the Presbyterians to levy this new extra tax, but they made this plea against the tax at the time. We have just started our settlement. Our little cabins have just been built and little gardens and patches just been opened. Our fields not cleared. We have, we have just been taxed to the limit to build a fort for protection against the Indians. We cannot possibly pay another tax now. This is the only substance of their plea. The tax was levied. It could not possibly be paid at that time. An auction was called. Sales were made. The cabins and gardens and patches and even their graveyards were sold. Good heavens, they don't even sell you graveyards here. I mean, if, if you got a graveyard, it's tax exempt. Rightfully so. I don't think that the people buried in it could come up with any tax. Uh, I don't know, dead vote? I don't know. They, yeah, they were right. The dead vote in Georgia and yeah. and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, maybe a few in Arizona. Anyway, I digress or regress, as I say. Uh, <clears throat> property valued at 363 pounds and five shillings sold for 35 pounds and 10 shillings. Some of it, at least, was said to have been brought by the, bought by the preacher who was to preach there. Hmm. <laughs> that sounds kind of cheesy. The settlement was said to have been left ruined. A large book could be filled with the oppressive laws. Ter terrific, terrific, terrifically uh, burdensome acts of taxation, hard dealings of many sorts, direct directed mainly against Baptists, but these lectures cannot enter into these details. In the southern colonies, throughout the Carolinas and especially Virginia, where the Church of England held sway, persecution of Baptists was serious and continuous. Many times their preachers were fined and imprisoned. From the beginning of the colonial period to the opening of the Revolutionary War more than 100 years, these persecutions of Baptists were persisted in. We give some examples of the hardships of Baptists in Virginia, and yet, strange as it may seem, Virginia was the next place on earth after Rhode Island to adopt religious liberty, but that was more than a century away. But the hardships, as many as 30 preachers, at different times were put in jail and the only charge against them for preaching the gospel of the son of god and if that isn't just absolutely deploring all right i am going to stop there that is a good place for me to stop for this morning preach uh you want me to continue on or we'll yeah we'll, we'll close out and take a break Okay, and once again here, in everything you do, preach Jesus, and if you have to, use words. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Somebody didn't have to listen to the first part of that. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate the Lexington County Mental Health people allowing us to borrow Dale. <laughs> This misses here, Brother Steve. We'll take a break. I'm out on parole. <laughs> Lord God, I thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for everybody who Lord, made it out this morning, Lord God. We just thank you for this first part of service, Lord. And Lord, just ready to take this break now and get ready and get prepared, Lord, for the meal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.